Britain's Conversation. This is Cross Question. Good evening, I'm Ali Mirage on LBC and this is Cross Question. Tonight I'm joined by a stellar panel uh, from my left, uh, George Monbiot, the Guardian columnist and environmental campaigner. Uh, then we have uh, Dame Diana Johnson, a Labour MP and also uh, the chair of the Home Affairs Select Committee. Uh, on my right, we have Aaron uh, Bell, who is Conservative MP for Newcastle under Lyme. And also on my right, uh, Sarah Southern, who is a former advisor to David Cameron and also runs her own business coaching in media and politics, pe teaching people to do a really superb job. Maybe I can get a few tips from her as well. Now, you might like to ask the, the panellists anything, but you might want to think about uh, Rishi Sunak's trip uh, to Washington, the mega poll that we were just talking about in the last hour about who might win the next election. You might also want to think about this weight loss jab that GPs are being perhaps recommended to prescribe to people for weight loss, and also whether the British Army or what the British Army is saying about whether we can actually protect ourselves against hostile states, particularly in Russia. But you might also want to ask about anything else on your mind this evening. Uh, you know what to do. You can watch us on uh, Global Player. Call the number 03456060973 or text on 84850. And don't forget, you can watch Cross Question live on Global Player now. Call 03456060973. Tweet at LBC. Text 84850. Cross Question. Watch on Global Player. This is LBC. Great, so let's go to our uh, first uh, question, which is an, an Alexa question from Nicola in Hove. Leave campaign has told us in 2016 that a free trade deal with the US would be easy to get. Seven years on, it's no closer to happening and we only have uh, unfavorable deals with faraway places like Australia. Will we ever replace what we lost by leaving the EU? Aaron Bell. Uh, thank you. Good evening, Ali. Good, uh, thank you to Nicola for the question. Look, I voted to leave. Uh, my constituency in Newcastle on the Lime in Staffordshire voted to leave. Uh, it wasn't entirely about trade at all. It was about immigration. We've now got control of our immigration policy. As a result of leaving, we have taken back control of our money, our borders and our laws. Uh, I don't. I dispute that we have an unfavourable deal with Australia. I think we've got market access for things that we produce, such as uh, vehicles and uh, so on. So we have actually negotiated with the Australians. In terms of a free trade deal with the United States. I mean, that's obviously a matter for the United States as well. But Rishi Sunak, as you said at the start of the program, been in Washington at the invitation of Joe Biden and uh, announced 14 billion pounds of direct foreign investment from U.S. companies into, Brit into Britain, which, I th which obviously I welcome. Uh, whether we get a deal or not, we're obviously not going to get one this side of mm. the U.S. electoral cycle. And I don't know who's going to win the next uh, presidential election. I wouldn't want to speculate on that. I would welcome a free trade deal with America in due course and with the appropriate safeguards that we also discussed during the referendum campaign. But in terms of the EU, we have a free trade deal with the EU as well. It's uh, And thanks to what Rishi Sunak did with the Windsor framework and the negotiations and the statesmanship he showed with Ursula von der Leyen, we are now seeing a, an easier transition with the EU in terms of how we trade across the borders and particularly how that affects... And how much Ireland. did the Australia trade deal actually yield to the UK in terms of increase in GDP? Uh, I don't have that number on me, but you're about to you, tell me, I'm which, sure. which I'm very surprised because I, it, it's not very much. And yeah. you're a quiz champion, I would have oh, expected yes. you to know. <laughs> we'll come to that later. But it's, it's, hot. it's not yeah. going to move the dial in any way at all. Uh, <laughs> I'm seeing here Dame Diana Johnson has been very, very, sitting very calmly listening to this question. What do you think as a Labour MP? Uh, well, we are? all I'd reflect on is that we were promised a deal with the US by 2022. I think that was in the 2019 Conservative Manifesto. So clearly that's not happened. And mm. my understanding is that we're a long way down the list of priorities for the American administration in terms of d getting that deal with us. So, um, you know, it's just another promise that we were made that, that just hasn't happened. What, what worries me more, actually, is uh, because of the Inflation Reduction Act, which mm. the US has passed, because we haven't got that deal with the US, a lot of our British companies are not going to be able to access some of the incentives within that bill. And that worries me. And I know that Nick Thomas Simmons, who's the Shadow International yes. Trade Secretary, has written today to the government, to the Prime Minister, to say this is a real concern. And what's the Prime Minister going to do about this? 
he's in Washington in, in in the US now. I did note as well he goes on a day so he doesn't have to come to Prime Minister's Question Time on a Wednesday. Well, Angela Rayner does particularly. She does well, very she? well. She does very you well. But I, I just think it's a bit of a shame the Prime Minister can't turn up to PMQs. It's once a week, and he could have gone to the US. Later well, on. let me ask you this. Uh, just on, you mentioned the Inflation Reduction Act. Just for the listeners who may, uh, just as a reminder to the listeners, this is the $370 billion mm. that the uh, US government is ploughing into new technologies, particularly in the green sector, hydrogen, battery storage, carbon capture and storage. And the, the charge is that this is favouring US companies which have to produce a certain amount of content within the US, and this is unfavourable. Why don't we just respond with our own version of the IRA? Well, certainly, I think the government need to do far more than they've been doing up Is to Labour now. Is Labour going to do that? Uh, well, can I just say, yeah. you know, Parliament ended yesterday at half past two in the afternoon. I've been an MP for 18 years. And the fact that Parliament is not sitting for a full day... The, there are things that governments could do. I want an active government that actually supports British business, as does Rachel Reeve. She's been talking about that on her recent trip to the US. So I think there's far more that could be done to support our, our British companies. Sarah Southern, we, we didn't get a deal with the uh, US. Will we ever get what we had with the EU replaced by other trade deals? Well, I think this is what's very interesting about the vote we had in 2016. No one really knew what it was that they were exactly voting for. It was whatever you wanted it, it to well, be. Quite. And also people voted for different reasons. Some people voted because they wanted their sovereignty back. Some people voted for, for other reasons. And I think, you know, because we're now seeing the, the, the full breadth of what life is like in a post-Brexit world and a, mm. not being in, in as many free trade agreements, it does make it a bit more challenging. But Kemi Berdenot would argue that she is flying around all over the world trying to do exactly this and doing a number of trade agreements. It's not clear how much they're all going to yield in terms of an uplift in GDP, but you can't fault her for trying. I mean, she is actually going around doing quite a few. Oh, absolutely. And I think that's a really positive thing. But I think the thing we're all waiting for is, you know, a newly established trading relationship mm. with the US. You know, Obama said such things like, you'll be at the back of the queue. Donald Trump said you'll be at the front of the queue. Joe Biden, I'm not really sure what he thinks of us this week. You know, it depends. So I think that is where we're at. We want to know what's going to happen, but it's not happening at the speed that we want it to happen at. George Wambio is looking completely unimpressed. Mm -hmm. George. Well, Nicola's question was, will we ever regain what we've lost? That's right. And the frank answer to that is no. I mean, the combination, the catastrophic combination of Brexit and austerity, the Tory wrecking ball, ripping down public life, ripping down civil society. It will take decades, generations, to rebuild the fabric of our lives from that. Now, frankly, I couldn't give a monkeys about a US trade deal. It's, it's, it, it's pretty irrelevant. It, by comparison mm -hmm. to what we've lost as a nation within our own borders as a result of these ridiculous, time-wasting, life-wasting policies imposed on us by successive Tory generations. Do you think that the argument that was made in the in the referendum, and we don't want to rehearse the, all the arguments there, but one of them was made about proximity, that you know the EU is our closest trading partner and proximity matters in trade. Are we just not finding out that that is now the case? Is that what, what in your view, is happening? Yeah, I mean, all the warnings were dismissed as Project Fear, but boy, have they been coming true. Aaron? Well, we have a free trade deal with the EU, and we're now adding to that with Japan, Australia, as you mentioned, New Zealand, and other countries that we want to get deals with. And perhaps in due course, there'll be one with the states, but as I said, I don't think we'll see that this side of the presidential election. Uh, but I, I reject what, what George says, as you'd expect. I, I don't think that, um, you know, what he's obviously advocating is going against what the British people voted for. And I don't want to rehearse all the arguments of the referendum, because there have been countless phone-ins on this channel and others mm. about that. But... Uh, Everyone who was trying to stop Brexit was essentially saying the people got it wrong. And if that's if that's the position that George is taking, that's the position the Labour Party is taking, well, let's hear them say it. Because I don't think my constituents got it wrong. I think our future is bright outside the EU. But I think it's fair to say that people were comprehensively lied to. Well, I think you'll find that um, the, the arguments that were made for Remain didn't come true either. We were promised a recession the moment we voted to leave uh, in a referendum campaign. Well, and a, a referendum longer, campaign with, with multiple people on both sides, as Sarah said. Some, you know, no one can promise exactly what will happen. No one can promise that there will definitely be a trade deal with any one country because it takes well, two to tango. You did in your manifesto in 2019. Well, we said we'd you, work towards them. You said, said by them. 2022 there would be a trade deal. Well, you, you, you cannot promise what the other side will deliver. I mean, you, you, we, well, don't put it in your manifesto. We, we negotiated, we negotiated <laughs> for that, but you have, you have to take to tango, as, you, as Alicia said. Sarah. As everyone has said, we don't want to rehash what, what happened in 2016, but 
it is a shame that this is kind of where we're at now, where we're looking at people having a, a struggle with the cost of living, mortgage rates being higher, rents in London being astronomically high, which is impacting many of us. And I can see why people are kind of going, look, we were promised all of these things in 2016. We were given this, you know, hacienda of what life would be like as a, a a Brexit Britain. And for some people, what they voted for hasn't come to fruition. So I can see why people are feeling a little frustrated, wondering why things haven't happened quickly. But then we've also got to remember, we've just come out of a pandemic. The last three years have been absolutely atrocious. Of course, things haven't happened as rapidly as we would have liked. We've had God knows how many prime ministers in that time. You know, we, I think people just want to see some stability and for the economy to get back on track. Sarah, I've just got to say, I was momentarily getting excited when you mentioned the Hacienda because I'm a DJ <laughs> in my spare <laughs> yeah. time. And I thought we're going back to Let's Manchester. Let's to Manchester. Fantastic, Ali. fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> Dana, let me ask you. If the EU relationship is so important and we're talking about this US trade deal, the fact that we haven't got it, George has talked about the fact that, you know, uh, certain untruths were told, perhaps, this is in his view, um, why is Labour not being more open and transparent and clear about its position on the EU? Mm. What's it scared of? I, I think the Labour Party is very clear that we had that vote in 2016. By the time of the next election, we'll have been out of the EU for, for several years. I don't think the deal we've got is the best deal. And I know that Keir Starmer has talked about improving the relationship with the EU. There was a lot of damage done around Brexit. Mm. And I think that there are improvements that can be made. But I think we've got to move on as a country. I don't want to spend the next few years rehashing the arguments that we had around Brexit. I spent enough of my life, you know, arguing around Brexit and why we shouldn't do it. But I think now we have to make the best of where we are. I agree with George. It, we're never going to get back, I don't think, to what we had with the EU. And my constituents in Hull, we're a port city. Yeah. We trade every day with Europe. We know how important Absolutely. proximity is. Yes. So, you know, my city, um, narrowly in my constituency, decided to vote for Brexit. But I think now my constituents are saying, well, this isn't what we were promised. They've got a uh, regret. Sorry, uh, uh, George. I, I find it frankly astonishing that even Nigel Farage can admit that Brexit has failed, but the Labour Party can't. Yeah. But, but, but if Nigel Farage was here, um, and he can dart in if he wants to, <laughs> yeah. um, he would say that it's failed because we haven't taken advantage, mm. as he sees it, mm. of the benefits of Brexit, although it could have been the benefit. There's been no Brexit dividend. It was and we're pussyfooting around. Yeah, it failed because it was destined to fail. I mean, the promises could not be met. And, and some, of, um, some of the issues just weren't even examined. I mean, Northern Ireland, it's like, mm. after the vote... Mm. Oh, yeah, what are we going to do about Northern Ireland? You know, all, all these huge issues were not even considered by the people... Well, the Northern Ireland Brexit. one, I remember John Major and uh, Tony Blair going to Northern Ireland to make this very point, didn't they? Mm. And it wasn't really focused on. Uh, last word to you on this, Aaron. Um, so I, I regret that the, the way the Brexit process took place created so much bad will with the EU. I think it would have been much better if we'd had a, a better deal from the start, but that to be blunt, was undermined by people who were actively seeking to encourage the EU to be tougher with us because they didn't want to leave us, us to leave in the first place. Uh, what we have now under Rishi Sunak, we have a bit of that stability that Sarah was referring to. Uh, I'm very impressed with what we achieved with the Windsor framework uh, mm -hmm. under Rishi, uh, and I think we're going to move to a much more constructive relationship Aaron, with the EU, Aaron, which is what we all want to see. Erin, to be fair, it was David Frost and then Boris Johnson that signed off that cack-handed Northern Ireland Protocol mm -hmm. deal, which had to be undone mm -hmm. by Rishi Sunak, wasn't it? Well, we, we, we had to make a good on the promise to the British people in, and that's what the 2019 election was all about that's why Labour lost seats like mine in Newcastle under Lyme because they basically put two fingers up to people who'd voted to leave who voted Labour all their lives and said we know better than you and maybe, maybe George is right you know maybe George is right that the Labour Party is full of people like that I know there are plenty of Remainers on the opposition benches I know that Keir Starmer went out in the, you know, before the last election saying there should be an option to remain. It's clear that that is the overall agenda of a future Labour government, or the, certainly Labour backbenches, because that's because they all you know, regret what happened. But I, I stick by the judgment of my constituents who voted to leave, and I think we can have a bright future outside the EU, but working with the EU. So all right. that judgment has now changed, and we've seen the polls showing clearly that a majority of people would rather the Brexit vote had not happened. So you're not going to stand by the current people, but you're going to stand by the old decision, which people now regret. That doesn't make any sense at all. I knew it was going to be an interesting panel this evening. <laughs> it's only the first question. Uh, so if you want to get your question in uh, to the panel, you know what to do. 0345 6060973. You can also text on 84850. You can ask Alexa very politely to send a comment into LBC uh, and ask uh, for a question uh, via Alexa to come in that way. You're listening to Cross Question on LBC. It's 817. This is LBC.
Cross Question on LBC. Text 84850. You're listening to uh, Cross Question on LBC. It's uh, 8 19, and I'm joined by my uh, stellar panel here, George Monbiot, the environmental campaigner uh, and also Guardian columnist, uh, Dame Diana Johnson, uh, Labour MP and Chair of the Home Affairs Select Committee, Aaron Bell, Conservative MP and Sarah Southern, former uh, Tory party advisor to David Cameron, no less. Let's go to our next question from Martin in Doncaster. Good evening, Martin. What would you like to ask? Hello, Ali and panel. Yeah, and best wishes to Ian too. 18 Absolutely. Months for- 18 months from a general election is levelling up working. Dame Diana Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm a Hull MP and I, I notice Martin's uh, from Doncaster. So um, I know in my part of the world, levelling up isn't working. Uh, we've seen huge cuts to public services over the last 13 years. Um, you know, we've just been talking about the EU and the funding that we used to get from the EU what we're getting now is a tiny proportion of that. So what I do know is that my constituents are, are much worse off. I cannot see in any way uh, the levelling up agenda has made an iota of difference, actually, in my constituency in Hull North. I think people, if you ask them in the street, would say, levelling up, what, what, what's that meant for, for us in Hull? Nothing. We haven't got the rail electrification. We were missed out of that when they talked about electrifying uh, the, the line across the east-west line um we've just missed out again on the carbon capture that we you know with 40 percent of industrial emissions come out of the humber so we should be the number one area for getting uh, the carbon capture money and investment uh, private sector money all lined up with that we missed out on that so for us in in hull and the humber certainly i don't think that leveling up's uh, working for us and i have to say if you talk to most northern mps i think they would say that agenda really hasn't uh, worked at all. Well, Aaron, you're a MP for mm. Newcastle under Lyme. Uh, what does levelling up mean to you and is it working? So, for 100 years before I was the MP, the seat was represented by Labour MPs and we have had more investment since that election than we had in those previous 100 years. In what years. kind of areas, Aaron? So, we've got the Future High Streets Fund, uh, over £11 million going to re- generate my town centre, the High Street there. We've had the Towns Fund deals, uh, both for Newcastle under Lyme and for Kids Grove in the north of the borough. Over £50 million of government funding through levelling up. Next door in Stoke-on-Trent has had it even more because it's a larger city obviously in the transforming cities fund government has put a lot of money into these places that were neglected that it had historic industries such as potteries in stoke-on-trent mining in newcastle under lime we are supporting these sorts of places and regenerating them but leveling up isn't just about spending a bit of money on things in the town center it's about investing in people it's about investing in skills and we're doing that only today you saw uh, the investment in the skills for 48 million pounds improving higher technical qualifications more money going to, to school leavers i've got one of the best uh, further education colleges in the country in my patch in Newcastle under Lyme that's what levelling up is really about it's about giving people opportunities and so they can make more of their own lives and then we can support our local economy through people having better paid jobs in places like Newcastle under Lyme Are we spending enough on infrastructure because that was also part of it wasn't it? Well this government's spending a a lot on infrastructure We've cancelled part of the leg of HS2 Uh, Well HS2 uh, we've we've got HS2 coming up uh, to Stoke-on-Trent there'll be trains serving Stoke-on-Trent in in the part of it coming forward Is it actually going to happen HS2? Well it's being built already I mean you know, I was travelling through the Buckinghamshire countryside the other day. You can see the work they're doing on it. So, yes, of course, it's going to happen. Uh, we've currently got the crew to uh, Manchester part of the bill going through the house. It's being done in stages, obviously. But it is coming to, to the West Midlands, which is obviously where I represent. OK, George Wambier, what do you think levelling up means and has it failed? Well, you, you, can see, you can see the reality. Food bank use just going through the roof. I mean, it's extraordinary. There were scarcely any people in this country using food banks before the Tories came to power. What a phenomenal policy failure. What a, 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 the, a result of this cruelty of austerity, which has shoved people into that horrendous situation where they have to rely on charity to eat. And this is a result of a wider and deeper trend of rising inequality, mm. particularly a shift um, uh, towards more and more of a rentier economy where mm. the people who make the money are the people who own the crucial assets and they mm. charge other people to use those assets. And of course, housing is, is one of those assets, but right across um, all, all sectors now, we, we're seeing people basically 
grabbing crucial resources and charging either the state mm. or individuals rent -seeking. to use them. Rent-seeking. That's exactly what's happening. Mm -hmm. And and the levelling up agenda is, is just window dressing. It's just an attempt to hide the reality of what's happening to people's lives. So, George, on, if that is the case, if that's what you... Uh, that is your uh, sort of diagnosis... What is the cure? Is it actually tax policy that should be part of levelling up and redistribution? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, tax and spending. That is what works. Now, Labour's not allowed to say that, but I'm allowed to say it. And we need to tax the rich much more. We need to tax property much more. We need to tax capital gains much more. And we need to spend that money on public services. I mean, we've got a £200 billion deficit on spending in the NHS, which is why so many people are being forced to go private. That is, is not a glitch. That was the plan. You know, they, they want us to go private because they're trying to rip down public services. Sarah, we're living in a cruel economy, according to uh, a cruel society, according to George. Well, I wouldn't necessarily go that far, but I think certainly if you to speak to people on the street and say, what is levelling up? Yes. I don't think they could necessarily explain it. In well, you're, in, you're a comms expert. What would you, <laughs> what would but, advice would you give? For me, I'm, I'm not 100% sure that it is working. Um, you know, I, I appreciate that the, the money is being put into certain areas, and that is good. I do think reinvestment into areas, for example, where I'm from, Hexham, there's a huge amount of money in terms of changing the, the high street so that it's going back to its heritage. That needs to happen because it has been quite run down. However, when you walk down the street, all of the shops are empty. So what's the point of having a beautiful building if there's nowhere for anyone to go, there aren't any jobs for people? So if it's not done in this kind of cohesive way, then I can't really see the value. And if people haven't got jobs that they can go to that are fulfilling and that give them enough money to live a full life and to spend money in their local economy to generate more jobs, what is the point of painting the building back to its original colour from 300 years ago? Mm. Dana, what, do you, what will Labour actually do around levelling up? I mean, do they, do they believe in the concept? Do they have an alternative prescription to what the Tories have done if they've failed? I think we want um, the economy to work for all parts of the United Kingdom. And at the moment, uh, that's not the case. And, you know, if you, if you live in Yorkshire, you know, for example, you've just been discussing infrastructure. There are real concerns about the investment that's needed around infrastructure which will help drive productivity, which will improve the, the what economic What kind of base. infrastructure, Diana? Well, one of the things that, you know, I've got a real bee in my bonnet is this trans-Pennine uh, route from Liverpool to Hull. You know, it takes longer to go from Liverpool to Hull than it does to go to London yes. to Paris. Yeah, yeah. You know, I can get there much quicker in another country. That's ridiculous, that we don't have that kind of infrastructure fit for the 2020s and beyond. And as I was saying to you, Hull's a part of this, and we were missed out in the electrification that was announced in the rail investment plan. Sure. OK, great. Thank you very much indeed, Martin, for your question. Uh, text question from Debbie in Blackburn. GPs are going to start prescribing weight loss jabs uh, in this. Is this the right way of making the country less fat? I'm not sure if this is targeted at me. <laughs> you can avoid watching this. I, I, knew, I know I need to lose a few pounds. I had a chocolate cookie earlier today as well. Uh, anyway, um, there is a plan for GPs to begin prescribing the new jab, Wegovi injection, I hope I pronounced that right, uh, which reduces appetite after research suggested users could lose more than a tenth of their body weight by taking it. Sarah Sutton. I'm really keen for this. Really? <laughs> I really am. Because if someone who um, needs to have an intervention on their weight, and I'm talking about people who are morbidly obese, who need to lose weight for health reasons or to have an operation, perhaps it's someone who would have had a like, gastric band fitted yes. in the past. If they're able to take this, which is not a surgery, to get their weight down, to then get them onto a healthy eating plan, mm -hmm. exercise, etc., but they just need that kick start, then this is a potentially but, a much safer but, way of doing it. But as you say, that that would be someone who's in a pretty, I mean, a very obese gastric yeah. band type territory. So it's quite specific in that particular case. Would you recommend it more widely? Well, I think we, if yeah. people read uh, celebrity papers like what I do, uh, <laughs> will know that this has become quite a, a, a cult in Hollywood, yes. uh, a different drug that they've been using over there. Yeah. I think people should avoid that. I don't think people right. who c have yes. already got that, but I think we need to remember that not everyone is able to lose weight super easy. There are reasons why people have to go and have gastric bands fitted. George? So 
I'm not arguing against the jab, but we have to look at the reason why we have an obesity crisis. Yes. Because we didn't used to. I mean, it, it, this has happened since the 1970s, and it's mm. been accelerating, and far, far more people are obese than, than they ever were. And and unless we tackle the roots of that, we will constantly be looking for techno fixes like this mm. um, to at, right at the end of the pipe to deal with a huge problem which is having devastating effects mm. on people's lives. Obesity is a communicable disease, and it's vector are corporations. Yes. Corporations pushing junk food, advertising that junk food, getting it into people's lives in combination with people who are both poor and time poor. Mm. They, they don't have access to, to healthier food. It costs five times as much to eat a healthy diet as one that's merely adequate in terms of calories. Fruit and veg are too expensive for very large numbers of people. Um, we should be acting to, to address that at the roots, we should stop the advertising of junk food. Mm. We should um, ensure that uh, everybody can afford decent food. And one of the things I want to see is subsidising fruit and veg at the point of sale. It wouldn't be very expensive, yes. but it would okay. cause enormous savings for the health service yeah. and greatly improve the quality. Well, well you of haven't life. told us all to become vegan like you. <laughs> well, well, not yet, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we'll give me time. <laughs> Indeed, George Diana. Well, I agree with what George has just said, and I think um, when I was on the Health Select Committee, mm. uh, we were very pleased that the government introduced the sugary uh, drinks tax, which then resulted in the reformulation of drinks, and the effects were, were very positive, and we were really keen that the government did something around food and around sugar in food, and they've, they've backed off that. They've backed off the advertising, mm. they've backed off measures that could help people. Uh, so I'm not against this um, injection but I do agree with George you've got to look at this in the round and exercise also has to be part of this and finding ways of encouraging people to exercise there's a real issue in lots of communities that places that people could exercise have closed because of cuts to um, yes. uh, local authority gyms and swimming pools and everything else the other thing I just wanted to say is I'm a big fan of free school meals mm -hmm. giving healthy yeah. food to children at school for me is is really important and I know Sharon Hodgson who's an MP in the North East mm. and was on free school meals when she was at school has been championing this in the Commons for a long time and whilst I'm pleased the coalition government reintroduced because we had it in Hull actually for a number of years the, the free school meals for the youngest children I would like to see that throughout our mm. school system I think that would be a big thing that would help with um, Good education around food. Erin, what do you how do you feel about injections for people who are overweight? Look, I I agree with what Sarah said. I, I mean it's a forty million pound trial. The government is is funding obviously. Yes. Uh, it needs to be through a clinical route, the GPs. I mean, it's not for us to say who should and shouldn't get it necessarily. I think yes. that should be a clinical decision. Uh, but, you know, obesity uh, costs about £6 billion pounds a year mm. to the NHS. It's the second biggest cause of cancer. Uh, you know, we've all got our own personal responsibilities to look after ourselves, just just like you. I probably have the chips rather <laughs> than the salad um, uh, occasionally. And, uh, you know, I, I have, you know, have to keep an eye on my weight. Yes. But in certain circumstances i think this is actually the right thing to do we help people stop smoking on the nhs and if you if you treat it like that and you think it as a health intervention i think there are some people out there who think that people are fat you know, shouldn't mm. be helped uh, but i think that's, i think that's the wrong approach a very interesting discussion and uh, I, I think that also personal responsibility is a whole other area we can go down but I think it's an interesting discussion we've just had on that so if you want to get your uh, questions into the panel for cross questions you've still got time you know the number 0345 6060 you can text on 84850 or ask Alexa to send a comment to LBC uh, you're listening to cross question on LBC at 832 the news headlines with Charlotte Morgan the Duke of Sussex has denied engaging in total speculation over his allegations of phone hacking by Mirror Group newspapers. Prince Harry has finished giving evidence at the High Court against MGN, which denies using illegal means to obtain information. Downing Street says the government's continuing to see what support Ukraine needs after an explosion destroyed a dam. Tens of thousands of people are still trying to leave affected villages. And 30 people have been arrested by police in Prague after a clash between West Ham fans and Fiorentina supporters. The sides are facing each other in the Europa Conference League final. LBC weather, thick low cloud for much of central and eastern England tonight. Drizzle in the far north of Scotland, but dry elsewhere with a low of four. This is LBC.
Cross Question on LBC. Hi, Tally Mirage. It's, uh, you're listening to LBC. It's a Cross Question, 8.36. Welcome back. And I'm joined by my stellar panel, George uh, Monbiot, the environmental campaigner. George, what did it feel like to do a citizen's arrest on John Bolton, the uh, US ambassador to the UN back in 2008 at the Hay Festival? Were you scared? Well, actually, it felt like flying because I suddenly found myself in midair um, with my hands and feet flapping. Uh, the biggest guy I've ever seen in my life came out from behind a curtain. <laughs> he was a <laughs> security <laughs> detail. He must have been over seven foot, this bloke. And he had me under one arm and just walked off. <laughs> so it was a bit ignominious. Well, you were very brave to try it. Uh, Dame Diana Johnson, the Labour MP and also chair of the uh, Home Affairs uh, Select Committee. Uh, how, how important do you think it is, Diana, for uh, MPs to have a serious job before they go into Parliament? You're a barrister. You're also a local councillor. Do you think it's important? I think life experience is important yeah. um, and I know we've got quite a few young MPs in now in yeah. their 20s and, I, I, and, that, and that's great to have that youthful enthusiasm yeah. and um, exuberance but I'm also conscious that you do as an MP it, yeah. it's important that you've got some grounding and you've yes. got some experience of, of the things that your constituents are going to deal with Absolutely. so I think a little bit of life experience exactly. is very helpful. Well life experience Aaron Bell <laughs> who's on my right here a Conservative MP has got an experience of winning several quiz shows, including the Krypton Factor and 25 grand on what was a deal or no deal? Yes, that's right. But, but I also agree with what Diana said. Um, I think we need a wide range of people. I, my day job before this was a computer programmer. Yep. One of the reasons I wanted to become an MP because I didn't think there were enough people mm. from the tech yep. sector in Parliament. Uh, and, you know, that's had negative consequences in the past in the way that yes. we've delivered IT, particularly in the NHS. Yep. Uh, but yes, I, I did used to do game shows as well. I <laughs> uh, haven't done those for a while. And Sarah, you also have now got a proper job outside <laughs> politics as well. <laughs> important to have a proper job. Indeed. Office. Excellent. Yeah. Great. Well, let's get... <laughs> thank you very much indeed. Uh, let's get to our next question, which is from Khalid in Leicester. Good evening, Khalid. What would you like to ask? I would say, look, the Russia-Ukraine con uh, conflict, surely we should be pushing for a ceasefire. And in the, and in the, in the, it, that should be the priority above everything else. I mean, there's further loss of life. We keep on arming the Ukrainians. Um, that's not gonna, that, that won't help the long-term solution. We need some, some long-term solution to this. I don't see how arming the Ukrainians is helping anyone. Don't see how arming the Ukrainians is helping anyone. Sarah Sutton. I don't think I can agree with that, as um, I'm not sure that a ceasefire is the solution. Um, we've got to get to a point where, there, of course, there is peace, but also that the Ukrainians win. Mm. Um, I think it is absolutely horrifying to watch the footage today of the floods that have happened mm. in Ukraine in the last 24, 48 hours from the bombing of, or the explosion rather, of that dam. Yes. We have to get it so that the Ukrainians can live independently in their nation. Um, and unfortunately, I think that can't be done through a ceasefire. What does, uh, Diana, what, uh, I mean, Sarah talks about uh, this thing. What, what's your view and also what does success look like for the Ukrainians? Well, we have to remember that a sovereign state was invaded by Russia. And so, uh, of course, we want to see peace. But I have to say, it's not peace on the terms of the Russians occupying a sovereign state. It has to be the Ukrainian state is intact. And, and so I certainly uh, agree that whilst we all want to work for peace, it's not under any circumstances. And it is... It is just so shocking, I think, to see the devastation of that country and, and the infrastructure this week without the, the dam mm. being... Um, the Kokova dam. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's just shocking. Um, and I think Parliament is actually united on this in the, our support for the Ukrainian people. And, of course, we've got the Home for Ukraine yes. scheme. Um, we've got lots of Ukrainians living in this country with us and we support them and want... Mm. Obviously, they want to return to their country. But, Diana, does success uh, for Ukraine mean pushing Russia out of Crimea? Well, that's a very good question because, of course, we didn't take the action we should have done at mm. the time of that invasion then. Um, and that has to be part of a negotiation. And, and obviously, if you listen to the president of Ukraine, he's arguing for uh, the, the borders that existed prior to that invasion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, let, yeah, let yeah. me just give a bit, a bit more context to the listeners here. Uh, when it comes to how Britain could intervene uh, in the Ukraine war militarily, we've heard today from experts in the British army telling us that the UK is now too weak to take on Russia and the UK cannot rely going forward in any similar exercise on the US. Uh, who are expected to do become more and more 
uh, focused on China and Taiwan. So we're kind of on our own, aren't we, Eric? Uh, well, no. Firstly, to answer Khalid's question directly, I, yes. I completely disagree. Uh, I think you would be rewarding Putin uh, in, in the sense that we, as Diana just said, we didn't intervene when we should have done, not just on Crimea, but going back to South Ossetia and, and Georgia and previous incursions. Uh, I think pushing for a ceasefire at this point would be rewarding Russia and you know, what would those terms of that ceasefire be? I think uh, Putin must be seen to fail and Ukraine must be seen to win. But Aaron and I'm, very, and I'm yeah. very proud yeah. of the support we've given. Yeah. Like 4.6 billion, that, I mean I'm on the uh, Parliamentary Armed Forces mm -hmm. scheme at the moment which is a fantastic opportunity for parliamentarians to learn about it and only next week we'll be going to see the training of Ukrainian forces here mm -hmm. in Britain. Um, to answer your second point about the yeah. British Army, well, the British Army isn't set up to invade Russia. That's not what you know, the standing army of the British, uh, the British Army is designed to do. But what we have shown is through our technological advan advantages over Russia and the technology that we've given to the Ukrainians, such as the end laws, the storm shadow, the challenger tanks and so on, uh, we have actually in, you know, helped Ukraine, which was a, you know basically relying on old Soviet kit, to have a number of uh, counteroffensive yeah. results against the Russians. Sh we... And that's based on yeah. our technology. Should we give them uh, planes? I mean, Zelensky came to Parliament, spoke in Westminster Hall, everyone clapped him, he came in his car keys, he's a very eloquent speaker. Should he get the planes? Yeah, my, my view is that uh, as this goes on, depending on obviously the, the needs on the ground, and we have to be guided by the intelligence on the ground, I think we need to progressively back up what we've said diplomatically with the force that he requires to eject the Russians from, from the parts that they've invaded. Because... Uh, that is what is required not only for the good of the Ukrainian people, but also to properly uh, dissuade not only Putin from ever trying this again, but also uh, to dissuade the Chinese from doing the similar things in Taiwan as well. George. It's a horrible situation. Um, sovereign country invaded by a much bigger, better armed neighbour. Um, very, very hard to resolve. I mean, I, yeah, I, I would disagree with the question in that. Um, if it were our own country, if if another country had um, occupied, say, Kent and Sussex, mm. you know, we would be crying out for other people to help us regain our borders and and expel the, the people who had invaded. My fear is that this could go on forever. You know, it's not easy to see the end of it. It really isn't. It's you know, the, the two sides are dug in now. Um, Putin staked a lot on this. He staked, staked everything on it. He really has, and he's got endless numbers of people to throw into it. Um, this is the thing, and it's, a, it's a very little to lose at the moment yeah. for him. So, so I, you know, I think we do need to have some big conversations about, you know, where do we see this going? Yes. What, what, is, what is the outcome? What, and what does success look like, which I think mm. is um, it's an interesting question. Uh, and very quickly to you, Carly, just for a very, very brief comment on what you've heard. I, I I agree, but I want uh, the double standards also is, is is infuriating. What we do? Why why are we supporting Israel when they're annexing continuously on a daily basis in Palestinian lands, their homes, their their their, their jobs, their their is lifestyles? Yeah. We hear you, Khalid. That's a totally different topic for another day. Maybe that will come up on another quest, cross question another time. Thank you indeed very much for your uh, call. So let's have another. Uh, let's have another question um, after the break. Uh, if you want to ask any more questions, you know what to do. 0345 6060 973. Uh, you can text on 84850. You can ask Alexa uh, to send a comment into LBC, uh, followed by your uh, question. You're listening to Cross Question on LBC. It's 844. This is LBC. The Elizabeth.
Cross Question on LBC. Call 0345 6060 973. Uh, this is Ali Mirage. You're listening to Cross Question. It's 8.47 on LBC. And uh, if uh, you want to ask a question, you've still got a time, 03456060973. Now, next text question in from Ben in Dorking. M&S are the latest supermarket who uh, are stopping putting sell-by dates on milk, making us rely on smelling to see if it's gone off. Are we really risking a food poisoning outbreak uh, just so companies can do some greenwashing? Well, George Wombio, I've got to come to you on this. <laughs> yeah. Uh, look, 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 we've got a huge, huge series of food issues. I mean, really massive. I've just today been testifying on food security in front of the Environmental Audit Committee right. because it's like, you know, we're looking at the potential for systemic failure in the global food system, like the banking failure in 2008, mm. but with even bigger consequences. So, to be honest with you, by comparison to that, this is pretty small change. Um, you know, we, we've got to change everything about the food system. Mm -hmm. um, I, I strongly believe we've got to move away from animal products, and, and the reason for that is their enormous environmental footprint. It's as big as fossil fuels, and just just as we should be leaving fossil fuels in the ground, we should be ending the eating of animals. Um, there's all sorts of other reasons as well. Um, so, yeah, we can argue about how long a dairy product should stay on the shelf. I would be arguing that dairy product should not be on the shelf. But doesn't it stop wastage as well? Well, yes, um, it, it, it can have that effect. Um, food wastage is an, is an issue. It gen generally is greatly exaggerated because it's the one issue that we can all safely talk about. We all hate waste, right? We do. But the, but the other issues, like animal farming, we can't safely talk about. You know, most people don't want to touch it. Not, yet, not yet, but not yet. But the cultural conversation could be changing. Yeah, around. well, I'm doing my best. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Sarah? I don't follow uh, sell-by dates anyway. Yeah. Oh, really? I, I very much live on the edge. <laughs> why, why is that, what, Sarah? Why is that? Well, I grew up on a farm. Right. I'm sorry, George. Um, <laughs> and I don't know. I just kind of think that they've got to estimate how long something's going to last. But my ability to look at it and smell it and taste it is probably more accurate. So... Just live your life a little bit more wild with your own fridge. Wow, but it's all <laughs> happening on the panel tonight, Diana. <laughs> well, I must say, I, sn I sm sniff milk. I don't go by the, the date on it. So I've been kind of doing this already. Is this what you do in the House of Commons? <laughs> I do, actually, because I've got a little fridge in my office. Oh, and when you buy milk on the Monday and then you're away on the Thursday, by the following Monday, you're wanting to see it's all right. So, yes, I do. And I, and I think, you know, I, I take the point, really, live on the edge a little bit. And, <laughs> just uh, you know, I, I was just thinking. Yeah, just, just to sniff some milk. Yes. That'll be the front page of a tabloid. <laughs> sniffing milk. You, you know, exactly, Diana Johnson in <laughs> sniffing milk horror. Yeah, in, in her office in, in Parliament. Her office. Yes. Aaron. No, I'm, I'm with everyone on this. I don't, you know, I don't go by sell by dates. In fact, one of these people that goes around trying to buy the yellow stickers in the uh, supermarket, you know, on, on the day that the date's there. Yes. And, you know, there's a lot of leeway built into those sell by dates. So if people. Do, do, you know, go buy them religiously, then there's an awful lot of wastage, as, as George was alluding to. And I don't think we're just risking a food poisoning outbreak. You know, most people can smell when the milk has gone off. Um, and, you know, it's not going to kill you if you do have something that's like a day over or something like that anyway. So I think it's a sensible uh, move on, on this front. Yeah, I'm a bit of a sniffer myself as well, I Good. must say. Well, especially with own. food Good. inflation where it is at the moment. We're coming out today. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, Robbie in Chelmsford uh, is calling. Uh, Robbie, uh, what would you like to ask? Good evening, everyone. So, Prince Harry, during his evidence at the court today, suggested that the UK government and media were at rock bottom. To what extent do the panel agree with those assertions? Aaron? No, I, well, I disagree with Prince Harry, obviously. Uh, I mean, I haven't been following this court case in too much detail, and it, as the Prime Minister said, we don't normally comment on the royal family yes. as a government. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I do think Harry is wanting to have his cake and eat it. He's decided not to be part of the royal family, yet he's still trading on his image as a prince, uh, and, you know, I have every sympathy for what he went through, obviously, as a child, losing his mother, and there was obviously a lot of press intrusion, mm -hmm. but from what I have seen, the, the coverage I have picked up of this uh, this court case, you know, his evidence has been called into some question, uh, but I, I completely disagree with him about uh, the government being at rock in fact, I think that we are delivering on the UK's uh, people's priorities. Well, on, I, expected, on the I, I expected you might say oh. that. <laughs> no, you're well, laughing. I, I expect you're, that, that what I'm going to say you would uh, expect me to say, which is, well, I have some sympathy with that, that the government are at rock bottom. I think, you know, we've been in a terrible place for the last few years. Um, obviously, we've got Rishi Sunak now trying to stable 
uh, stabilise the boat. Um, but there's lots of problems, you know, and the people's priorities. I mean, he says that he's going to stop the small boats coming over yeah. and that's not going terribly well. Um, mm. So I, I'm not sure that uh, things are as well. What's your policy on the boats then, Diana? Sorry, what's, what's, what's your policy on the boats then? Well, the Home Affairs Select Committee did a report last year and we set out very clearly what the government should do and the first priority should be to clear the backlog, which your government has allowed to build to the ridiculous rate of over 170,000. And that's why you've got all these people in hotels and you're having to spend millions you've of got, pounds you've a You've got day. no proposal to stop the incentive for people to come over the channel. There's absolutely none. No. The Labour Party has set out very clearly what its proposals are, and that is to actually go after the traffickers and the well, smugglers. We're doing that. But well, the people that well, really it's not working. If you let, if you let you're spending stay, lots of money with the French, yeah. and the effect is that they are still coming across in those small boats. We it, also doesn't take, it, doesn't, it doesn't take much for it to descend into <laughs> <laughs> but we have clear George, things you could in, do. Indeed. Yeah. George, what do you think? Is the government at rock bottom? Well, I, I, I hope he's right, uh, because I really hope that government and media are at rock bottom, because if this isn't rock bottom, mm. I dread to think what lies underneath. Isn't it interesting that he said it as a prince, though? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, I think he's doing us a big... Uh, he's doing us a big service. You know, he is exposing aspects of the mm. filth and corruption... That, that govern large parts of, of this country. You know, the, the establishment, and, you know, of course, as a prince, you know, he is establishment, but, you know, there are parts of the establishment which are fundamentally corrupt, and large parts of the media, unfortunately, fall into that category. Large parts of the government fall into that category. Now, if we saw this anywhere else on earth, we wouldn't hesitate to say the word corruption, but you cannot use the C word in this country. For Do you think he's, he's brave? Yeah. Interesting. Sarah? I'm really happy that Prince Harry has brought this case, um, as I feel as though a lot of people felt as though the behaviour of the media was all tied up in a nice little bow and put to bed after Leveson. Mm. Mm. But it hasn't. Yes. There are still people's lives who've been completely destroyed, not just by phone hacking, but by other elements um, of kind of scurrilous things that the press have done. And I do think this is actually quite a brave thing that Prince Harry's done by being so honest and kind of raking over the coals. You know, he's talking about his former relationship mm. with Chelsea Davy. They broke up about 15 years ago. You know, it, it, they're talking about something quite historic, something yes. that, you know, he's having to go back through. But it's such an important principle to him. Yes. My only frustration with it is, is that the only reason he's able to do that is because he has a huge amount of wealth behind him. It is an incredibly expensive to sue a newspaper. Well, yeah. it, it, you, some would argue that he, he's uh, one of the few people who could actually do it. Yeah. So, yeah. interesting discussion on that. Now, the next question is from Phil in Purley. It's a text question. Uh, with Sunak in the States, are we finally projecting an image of sense and competence to the rest of the world rather than pure chaos? Well, admittedly, it was quite a low bar. <laughs> uh, Diana? Well, exactly. It was a very low bar. And after um, the previous Prime Minister, after Boris Johnson, for example, and um, then the previous Prime Minister, you know, he is, I give him his due, he is uh, very managerial in his approach and he's trying to steady that ship. But I have to say, I think our reputation abroad is has been damaged by the last few years. Um, and I think it all started after Brexit. I think it's carried on with Boris Johnson and um, then with the previous Prime Minister as well. And, you know, that... That terrible I budget. It, didn't, didn't I it, can't. It didn't last no. too long. I don't blame you for forgetting. No, I mean it was. Maybe it's deliberately days. you're forgetting. <laughs> I think it was longer than the. It was the lettuce. The lettuce. Well, there was longer. a competition between the lettuce. Yes. Yeah. So the end. To, the the lettuce outlived the yes. premiership. Yes. Yeah. So I think you know it is a very low bar. George. Well, so he he's presentable. You know he he's photogenic. Um, he's not. Um, a walking chaos as <laughs> Truss and and Johnson were, but. In some ways, he is just as bad. You know, here he is trying to stifle the COVID inquiry. You know, that's the same old mm -hmm. Tory sleaze and corruption as we've seen from, from, from the previous prime ministers. You know, he doesn't want the truth to get out. And so that basically says, yeah, he's just continuity. Aaron, it's a well, corruption. Look, I, Rishi Sunak is a problem solver, and we have a number of problems. And you've got a lot of problems. We have, we have, <laughs> we've got a lot of problems we, 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 we have problems, Diana, because we've been through a pandemic, and Putin's invaded Ukraine and pushed up energy, and you've been energy prices across the world. Years. We, we, but those two things have happened since the last election, yeah, right? And, we, and, we, and it's government's job to years. deal with problems as they arise. Mm. And we've now got high inflation because of the energy price shock. Uh, we've also got NHS waiting lists that are long because of COVID backlogs. And mm, we've also got the immigration problem. Because of austerity, because there's a £200 billion deficit. That's why there's 
my, my, my view is that Rishi Sunak is absolutely delivering on, on these priorities. He's very, very clear. He's put things out there for people to judge him by in terms of halving inflation, growing the economy, cutting our debt, uh, cutting the NHS waiting list and stopping the boats, and he will be judged on those. Do you think he's taken seriously on the world stage? Yes, I do. Absolutely think he's taken seriously on the world stage. As you can see, he, that's why Joe Biden invited him to discuss. He's met him four times in recent months. Well, I think that's encouraging. Mm. I think we should have a strong relationship with the United States. I also think we should have a strong relationship with the EU, as I said earlier. And uh, the, the relationship, the, what we saw at Windsor earlier this year, was a, a, a demonstration of his di diplomatic mm. skills as mm. well. So I th I'm very, very pleased that he's our Prime Minister. So are we uh, projecting a, an image of a sense and competence finally? Well, when I saw the picture of Rishi Sunak and his wife getting off the plane in Tokyo, there's just this beautiful image of this very attractive couple. I thought, oh, thank goodness. Like, <laughs> here we are. We've got the optics that we actually want rather than just chaotic people with... Oh, 44 days. Of... But it does matter, though, George, because yeah. how people this are viewed... But this you know, He's and, running and, a PR and, firm. Yeah, George. yeah, Come well, on. yeah. And so, you know, th this, this is our first oligarch prime minister worth hundreds of millions of pounds who treats the entire country as a flyover state. He helicopters from one place to another because he doesn't want to rub shoulders with the hoi polloi. I mean, this is a total Busy catastrophe schedule, for, Busy a country, schedule. For, for a country which is in the depths of austerity, massive inequality, food bank use going through the, through the roof. Yeah, it, it's, he's the worst possible person to have at prime, as well, Prime Minister at the worst possible time. Well, that, you made that point very strongly. Uh, right, for, for the fun question, to lighten the mood a little bit after that, uh, Charlie in Bolton uh, asked this. In our family, we're buzzing uh, to go and see the latest superhero flick, The Flash. Sounds interesting. Uh, who is your panel's political superhero and which famous superhero are they most like in your view? Sarah. OK, I'm going to go with Margaret Thatcher. Oh, what and a the surprise. Reason is, the reason is, don't pull a face, the reason is, is that growing up, I thought only women were allowed to be in charge because the Queen was the Queen, That's true. Margaret Thatcher was the Prime Minister, and my mum was in charge in my house. <laughs> so until I was yeah. nine and a half, I yeah. thought only women were allowed to be powerful. <laughs> Very so, sensible. For, so she would probably be Wonder Woman then as a, as a superhero. Indeed. Erinville. I've got a new one in recent years. It's Vladimir Zelensky. Oh. I honestly think uh, well. his, it was an absolute study in courage when that invasion happened. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah, widely predicted that he'd be dead within 24 hours when he was appearing yeah. on the streets of Kiev inspiring his people. That's true. And he has absolutely, you know, rallied his people and rallied, and rallied the West behind him. Yeah. And I'm, you know, very grateful for, the, as I say, the support that we've offered him. I think we called it right early on. Ben Wallace yeah. called it right early on. Zelensky is an absolute hero in my book. Well, I think a lot of people would agree. Diana? Uh, I'm going to go back into Labour history and I'm going to say Barbara Castle. Oh, I yes. think she could have been uh, the first Labour woman leader and Prime Minister if things had been different. <laughs> She didn't get it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. but, but she, yeah. could, have, she yeah. could have been great for Labour and she could have beaten, yeah. uh, I think, Indeed. Margaret. George, yeah. um, Caroline Lucas and her superpower is to replicate herself because there must be at least eight of them. <laughs> <laughs> the amount of stuff she does. She's had the most amazing political career. Super. What a nice note to end on. I must thank my panel, uh, George Monbiot, uh, Dame Diana Johnson, uh, Aaron Bell, Sarah Southern. Thank you very much indeed for a really lively and entertaining uh, discussion this evening. Thank you very much indeed. Now, coming up in the final hour, GPs could soon begin prescribing a new weight loss jab after research suggested it could lead uh, to those uh, losing a tenth of their entire body weight. The Wagovi jab blunts appetite and makes the taker eat much less. Sounds helpful for me. Uh, and has now been approved for use by the NHS. The health secretary says this new jab could be a massive boost to the economy by reducing the money that the NHS spends on treating illnesses caused by obesity. But if you think you could do with losing a few pounds, would you really consider to getting injections to do that? And when it comes to our health and well-being, has all sense of personal responsibility drained away? Call me on 0345 60 60 973. On your radio, on Global Player and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation, this is LBC. From Global's Newsroom at 9 o'clock.
Prince Harry has told the High Court the press has misled him his whole life to cover up their wrongdoing. The Duke of Sussex has finished giving evidence in his case against Mirror Group newspapers. The Daily Mirror's publisher denies phone hacking to get stories about him. Media lawyer Jonathan Code was at the court where the Duke spoke about his time with ex-girlfriend Chelsea Davey. You very much sense how strongly he feels that both his and Chelsea Davey's lives have been in...